Okay, well, uh, first I talked about the physiology of a neuron, how a neuron literally works. Then I talked about neural networks, how in theory uh, assemblies of neurons connected by excitatory and inhibitory synapses could compute interesting logical functions and concepts. Now I'm going to show a number of examples in which features of neural wiring that we know about through electrophysiology actually explain certain aspects of your conscious experience. Okay? I'm gonna, these three <laughs> wiring features are called lateral inhibition, opponent process circuitry, and habituation. And I'll explain each one in turn. But there is a common denominator. All of them get the brain to respond to differences and contrasts in the world rather than steady states. So if you were living in a world that was uniform uh, gray, None of these circuits would respond, even though light was pouring in. What they do is they attune you to differences in space, differences in time. And I'll explain how that works. Okay, lateral inhibition. This was the first feature of a neural circuit that was actually discovered in a living organism. And it works as follows. Imagine that each one of you is connected to all of your neighbors. And when you get stimulated by my laser pointer, I won't uh, actually do it because my aim isn't that good and I don't want to blind anyone, uh, you do two things in conveying a, uh, in response to this stimulation. One is you stand up. The other is you push all your neighbors down. Okay? So imagine what would happen then as, you were, as one of you was stimulated, as a whole bunch of you were stimulated. stimulated. Okay, that is lateral inhibition wiring. Let me just show you what that consists of uh, anatomically. Here's your eyeball. Uh, just to remind you, I'll go over this in the other two lectures. Uh, vision begins when light bounces off an object, is focused by the cornea and lens, forming an image on your retina, layer of light-sensitive cells. The rods and cones convert light into neural impulses, which are then conveyed along a set of ganglion cells that exit in the blind spot and form the optic nerve, which then goes to the visual parts of the brain. Here is a patch of your retina. Uh, these R's are uh, receptors, that is rods and cones. Let's, call, let's assume they're cones. Uh, here we've got an intermediate level of tissue in your retina. Here's your ganglion cell, which carries a signal to the brain. And here's how lateral inhibition works. Uh, the artist here has drawn an oval around a bullseye of uh, cones. Uh, now that doesn't actually exist in the retina. Just the artist, for our convenience, has drawn an oval around them. Why those? Because all of those feed with excitatory synapses to a cell called a bipolar cell. That doesn't matter. But it feeds into another excitatory synapse into the ganglion cell, which carries a signal to the brain. So in that little bit of your retina, anything, whenever it gets stimulated by light, it causes an uh, increase in uh, signal activity to the brain. Now the artist has also drawn a donut around that bullseye. And here, also studded with, with uh, rods and cones, but here, notice how the wiring diagram differs. It goes through a kind of cell called the horizontal cell. That's not important. However, the Output from the horizontal cells connects to this bipolar cell by an inhibitory synapse. Here the artist uses a uh, flat line rather than a dot, but we're still talking about inhibition. And it's the sum of all of the excitatory inputs from the bullseye and the inhibitory inputs from this surround <coughs> that get combined, smushed together, and that get sent via the ganglion cell to the brain. If I were just to take a flashlight and bathe this entire area in light, would the ganglion cell fire? Well, not necessarily, because it, while it would be stimulated by all of the receptors in the center, it would also be inhibited by all the cells in the surround, and they would pretty much cancel each other out. We're going back to my analogy of you guys. For some, one of you, if, if you followed the rule that I just mentioned, namely when light hits you, stand up, push down your neighbors. Well, you're all bathed in light. You're all going to be trying to stand uh, up. You're all going to have neighbors that are pushing you down. You're probably not going to stand up very high. Uh, however, let's say I were to 
zap you with a narrowly focused beam of light uh, that just illuminated a few of you, well, the guy at the center still wouldn't be able to stand up very tall because he's being pushed down by his neighbors. But the ones at the edge between light and darkness, they are being stimulated by light. They don't have a neighbor pushing them down because the neighbor is in darkness. Those are the ones who are going to stand up tall. Going back out of our analogy, back to the actual visual system, if you had a beam, a bright spot that stimulated only the center, surrounded by inky blackness, that would send the ganglion cell screaming its head off because it would be getting excitation from the center. It would be, not be getting any <coughs> inhibition from the surround, and so it would be firing at its maximum rate. Okay? That's lateral inhibition. Now, of course, your retina does not just consist of one <coughs> little, uh, tiny little bullseye. It is uh, peppered with rods and cones and these little circuits over its entire surface. Here we have a whole line of uh, receptors, rods or cones in your eye. Here we've got a bunch of ganglion cells, and I, here we're just using the symbolic notation of arrow means excitatory, polka dot here means inhibitory, and as you can see, every receptor excites a ganglion cell connected to it, while inhibiting its neighbors, dot, dot, arrow. So if you have a whole array of these, now what's going to happen when they get stimulated by a pattern? For example, this pattern over here. Here we have space left to right. This is a spotlight. If we plot light, and, and this, by the way, we're plotting just the physics of light. We're not talking about the brain at all. This is just what we're stimulating the retina with. So uh, going from left to right, plotting the intensity of the light, we've got black, 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 white, 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 black, 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 black. White spotlight, black field. What is going to be the output of all of these ganglion cells that get sent to the brain as a result? Is it going to be off, 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 on, 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 off, 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 off? No. Lateral inhibition changes the nature of the signal. It does some signal processing or analog computation. What's going to happen is that the ganglion cells that respond to that part of the visual field are going to get excited by the light uh, hitting their respective rods and cones, but they're also going to be inhibited by their neighbors, just like you guys being pushed down at the same time you're trying to stand up. The ones at the edge, the one at the edge though, has the advantage of being stimulated by the light hitting its rod or cone, not being inhibited by the uh, rod or cone that is sending an inhibitory connection to, to it. So it is free to uh, kind of scream its head off. Conversely, if we now look at the ganglion cells that respond to the dark part of the visual field, the ones over here in the middle of darkness are not being excited on the other hand, they're not being inhibited, so they're kind of halfway in between. The bit of darkness that is adjacent to the bright spot is not being excited, and it is being inhibited. It's being pushed below its resting rate. Therefore, the entire pattern of output is this kind of Batman figure, where the uh, edges of the spot are uh, firing at a greater rate than average, the edges of darkness are firing at a lower rate than average, and uh, the ones in the middle of lightness or in the middle of darkness aren't really doing anything very interesting. Now, it turns out that that bit of circuitry, which has been uh, established just by poking electrodes in the visual system of sim simple animals, can account for a number of visual illusions that we, an entire human being, can report from our conscious experience. And there are three classic uh, psychological phenomena known before anyone knew how a neuron worked. Back in, they were in psychology textbooks in the days of William James that can be explained by uh, the knowing how this bit of wiring works. The first are called mock bands. Now, if you look at this pattern of stripes, you, uh, if you look very closely at the lightness of each one of them, you might notice that perceptually they don't appear uniform. 
that be? Okay. So each one, do you notice, um, let's take this guy over here. Does it look a little bit brighter along this edge and a little bit darker along this edge? Mm -hmm. Most people will report that. Likewise over here, even though it's uniform gray from edge to edge, you should see a little bit of brightness over here, a little bit of darkness over here. And the reason is that just like that Batman uh, output as a result of a uh, spot input, if you were to plot physical intensity over space, you'd get this perfect staircase but feed those intensities through a lateral inhibition network, and you get this spiky pattern over here, <clears throat> this sawtooth, which we perceive as a little lighter than uh, on this edge, a little darker on this edge. So those are called Mach bands, discovered by the uh, physicist Ernst Mach. Uh, and here is a, <coughs> a blown up demonstration, a reminder of why it happens. For A, uh, A gets a uh, ganglion cell, that is a neuron that feeds the brain, uh, gets stimulated by all this uh, lightness over here, but on the other hand gets inhibited by all this lightness over here, whereas this one here at the edge gets stimulated by the light hitting its rods and cones. It is not inhibited by its neighbors, because its neighbors are sitting in a slightly darker area, and so it is perceived as brighter. <coughs> Conversely, this a ganglion cell responding to this portion of the visual field does not get much excitation. It also doesn't get much inhibition. This one over here does not get much excitation, and it does get some inhibition by its neighbors, and so it will be uh, driven below its resting rate. It will be perceived as a bit darker than the background. This is called a herring grid and uh, has a similar explanation. Uh, it, the illusion consists, this will be stronger or weaker depending on where you're sitting, but you might see ghostly little uh, gray spots at the intersections. All of the intersections except the one that you're looking at for interesting reasons, but we'll ignore that for now. Uh, and the explanation is similar. The reason that you get, if you're looking over here, you should see gray spots here, 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 and here, is that uh, for ganglion cells that respond to an area at the intersection of these city blocks, they are getting uh, excited by the rods and cones feeding them. They're getting inhibited from four sides, and so they're going to appear a little darker than the rest of the white, hence gray. The ones in the middle of the block are only getting inhibited from two sides rather than four sides. They are not getting inhibited as much. They are firing at a higher rate. They are perceived as white or white. And that's why the intersections <coughs> seem gray, whereas the middle of the city blocks seem white. Here's an, another version of it. Uh, you might be able to see, if this is working, faint diagonal gray lines. Do you see them? Oops, oh, so. Again, it may depend on where you're sitting. And this is my favorite. I got this as an email attachment. Uh, here the <laughs> artist has uh, amplified the effect, and you can actually figure out why if you work through it. But here you should see lots and lots of black polka dots. Uh, none of which exist. The, each one of these intersections is uh, white, white. Uh, and as you move your eyes around, the spots that are black and white should uh, change. I'll just give you a hint as to why that is true. And I won't explain it, but you can probably figure it out after I tell, tell you the following fact. In the fovea, the center of your visual field, the ganglion cells and the rods and cones uh, line up pretty much one to one. Each ganglion cell has a teensy, weensy little bit of the world that it looks at, which means that it can respond to very fine differences in space. In the periphery of your visual field, you've got massive fan in where a vast number of rods and cones feed a singular, single ganglion cell. So in the periphery, your brain is seeing the smeared uh, combination of a huge patch of visual field, all feeding into one ganglion cell and discarding fine differences. Okay, the second effect, this is called simultaneous contrast, uh, also uh, explicable in terms of lateral inhibition. Uh, I don't know how well this one works, but um, I'll show you a slightly better one. The idea is that these polka dots here, which are all objectively the same shade of gray, uh, this one should look brighter than that one. This is a slightly better one. Can you use does it work, actually? Mm -hmm. That is, does this polka dot look lighter than that polka dot? Mm -hmm. Okay, I can 
show you that they uh, are actually the objectively the same. Some I, you, you, people are always skeptical as to whether the artist in psych textbook illusions actually kind of jigger, tilt, puts a thumb on the scale to make it look uh, better than it is. But this is just to prove to you that they really are objectively the same. Okay? Likewise, if I swap them, uh, when you swap them, now this one should look darker than that one. Okay, so why do we have lateral uh, inhibition? Uh, why did uh, natural selection wire up the eyes of uh, most organisms this way? Well, basically, it's a way of ignoring what is constant across the visual field and paying attention to changes as you move across the visual field, which is another way of saying edges. Uh, so here we've got, say, a uh, rose. And the idea is that uh, if we look at this part of the visual field, it's like green, 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 kind of boring, boring, <laughs> boring, boring, boring. But when you shift from uh, green, whoops, sorry, green to pink, the brain takes notice. Something is interesting. Something interesting is happening at that part of space. Namely, that's where uh, leafy backdrop leaves off and rose begins. Likewise, inside the rose, it's pink, boring, pink, boring, pink, boring, pink, boring, until you get to another edge where pink gives way to uh, dark green. That is worth paying attention to. That's where rose leaves off, background begins. So there's a sense in which your brain is con converting from a sense of lightness, a set of lightnesses, to a bunch of detectors <laughs> for the images. If any, have any of you played in Photoshop? Um, you might notice that there is a filter called unsharp mask, which counterintuitively makes your images sharper. Uh, unsharp mask actually works very, very similarly to <coughs> lateral inhibition in the eyes, and it's a way of enhancing contrast at edges, make, make your fuzzy pictures look sharper. Okay, there are two other features of neural circuitry, which also respond to differences in the world, and which also can mechanistically account for differences in your conscious experience of the visual world. One feature is called opponent process circuitry, and it makes the brain responses, responsive to differences in quality, light, dark, red, green, hot, cold, uh, moving left, moving right. And the other is called habituation, which makes you respond to differences over time. That is, same, 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 different, you notice the change. Here's how they work. Okay, opponent process circuits, it's also a widespread feature of neural wiring throughout the animal kingdom. It works as follows. You've got two inputs to one uh, neuron, one output, that themselves respond to qualitatively different aspects of a stimulus. They can, and they can be, you can see this feature of wiring across many of the, uh, all of the senses. So you might have, say, a heat detector in your skin that feeds into a neuron, and a detector <coughs> of cold that uh, feeds into the same neuron, one of them exciting the neuron, the other inhibiting the neuron. Likewise, you might have a, uh, in fact, I will now show you, the cones of the eye, that is the receptors <coughs> that respond to uh, daylight, come in three different sensitivities. You have a uh, cone that is responsive most responsive to red light, to green light, and to blue light. If you ever uh, do photo printing in color, you know that you need three ink cartridges. Or if you look very, very <coughs> carefully at your computer screen or your TV screen, you'll see that there are uh, triplets of dots, red, green, and blue. The reason that the magical number is three whenever it comes to color is that there are three kinds of comb in the eye. And the designers of printers and uh, TV screens are basically capitalizing on the fact that there are three and no more than three different color inputs to the uh, eye. But crucially, the red, green, and blue cones do not send three kinds of signals to the brain. Before it gets to the brain, those signals are combined in the following way. Take this ganglion cell here. Again, a ganglion cell. Uh, is the cell that carries information from your eyeball out through the optic nerve into your visual brain. This uh, ganglion cell here gets 
excitatory input from a red cone, but it gets via a interneuron, a neuron in between, inhibitory input from a green cone. What does that mean? It means that this ganglion cell is not a red detector, it's not a green detector, it's a degree of greenness versus redness detector. It means that when it is uh, stimulated by red light or it doesn't get much green light, it's going to increase its activity level and you see that as redness. <laughs> Conversely, if it does not get much red input but it gets a lot of green input, its firing rate will be below the threshold and you will experience that as greenness. Likewise, uh, you've got a second kind of ganglion that gets excited by the blue cone, inhibited by the red and green cones, which together mix to give you yellow. The result is that this kind of input to the brain is a relative blueness versus yellowness detector. When it is excited, it makes you see blue. When it is inhibited, it makes you see yellow. But it, uh, so crucially, what opponent process circuitry does is it gives you a continuum where the positive uh, side, that is excitation, makes you experience one sensory quality. That same neuron, when it is driven below its resting rate, makes you <coughs> experience the opposite sensory quality. Now, um, okay. If you combine the lateral inhibition, that is, you uh, excite your output, you inhibit your neighbor's output, with opponent process, namely above the resting rate you see one color, below the resting rate you see another color, then you get a phenomenon that is similar to simultaneous contrast, which I indicated with those two big uh, polka dots, but you get a change not just in intensity, that is lightness, but also in quality, namely color. And here's a lovely example of that. Um, here you see a pale yellow X. Here you see a mauve X. But actually, if you follow the arm of this mauve X and continue it down to the arm of that X, you actually see that they're both gray, the same shade of gray. But against a yellow background, that gray seems purple. Against a purple background, that is yellow. Uh, what we're seeing here is a combination of the first bit of wiring, lateral inhibition, where uh, yellow here inhibits yellow here, purple here inhibits purple here. Combine that with opponent process, namely the relative rate of firing above or below the resting rate determines quality, and you get this simultaneous color illusion. Here's another example. Again, I got this as an email attachment. But the, this red over here and that red over there are the same. The difference is that these ones here are surrounded by four whites. These <laughs> ones here are surrounded by four greens. They change in uh, the shade of red, the hue that you experience. You should see this, depending on how the, the projector is calibrated, as more of a pure uh, apple red. This is more of a purple, even though objectively they're the same. Okay. Final uh, bit of neuro, neurophysiology that I will uh, explain. Uh, and this is, is called habituation. Namely, as a neuron fires a lot over a long period of time, it will drift back to its resting rate. It's almost as if the neuron gets tired. Now, it's not literally what happens, but it will, uh, in response to sustained stimulation, the neuron will not keep firing its head off indefinitely. Eventually, it kind of, you can think of it as almost getting bored, and it will drift back down and no longer register what it has been uh, registering so far. I mean, an intuitive example of that is when you walk into a room and it's got some smell, you notice it, you are uh, in the room for uh, half an hour or so, and you no longer notice the smell. If you imagine yourself now being a neuron, you understand habitually. If you, when you, uh, on a hot summer day, you uh, start to wade into cold water. Your feet experience a uh, rather unpleasant uh, cold. Then you stand there, you let your uh, feet, as we say, habituate, and uh, you no longer detect the temperature of the water. It feels like uh, body temperature. 
now you wade in another few inches, the part of the skin that is now suddenly exposed to water will uh, now feel the cold until you habituate uh, to that. Now, <coughs> again, I'm going to ask you to combine two of the separate features of neurophysiology that I explained uh, separately. Now combine habituation, the fact that neurons return to their resting rate, with opponent process circuitry, the fact that uh, downstream neurons respond to uh, give rise to a perception that will be two poles of a continuum, depending on whether they are above or below uh, their resting rate. And you get um, the uh, perceptual phenomenon that we call an after effect. Here's the way it works. You show stimulus A for a long <laughs> period of time until the A cells habituate. Then you show a neutral stimulus. Think of neutrality as meaning the following, equal amounts of stimulation from the A and the B. That could be the red and the green, the hot and the cold. Uh, what will happen? Well, when in an opponent process circuit, if it's getting equal input from two sources, but one of them has been habituated, because you've seen it over and over and over again, the other one will then dominate the input it will drive the uh, opponent process circuit below its resting rate, and you will perceive the qualitatively opposite sensory uh, quality. That is, the neutral stimulus will now be perceived as B, the opposite of the one that has been tuckered out by the repeated stimulation. Uh, this has been known literally for centuries, and uh, if you go way back in the history of philosophy, uh, I think it was uh, Erasmus who first called into question our perception of the world by noting that our senses can fool us. And he used, my memory serves uh, as an example, temperature after effect, which works as follows. You can try this at home. Have a glass of cold water, have a glass of hot water, have a glass of tepid water. Dunk one finger in the cold water, one finger in the hot water. Leave them there for about a minute. Your fingers will habituate. Now you put them in the tepid water. The finger that will be in the cold water will perceive the tepid water as hot. The finger that was in the hot water will feel, perceive the tepid water as cold. An amazing sensation. You can uh, try it at home. Uh, explanation is straightforward. If your sense of temperature depends not on your input from your warmth receptors, nor on the input from your cold receptors, but to the balance between them, opponent process, and you've got habituation, the hot inputs go back to normal as your finger sits in the hot water. Then when it gets a neutral stimulus, hot equals cold. The cold input is rare, rested and ready and rarer to go. The hot input has been tuckered out. So what is a neutral stimulus, tepid, is perceived as cold because the balance of the input changes. Now I'm going to show you the same thing in color and then in motion. Oh, uh, actually, before I put this on, what I want you to do is uh, I'm going to show you a uh, Union Jack in uh, odd colors. I want you to stare dead center at the Union Jack, trying as hard as you can not to move your eyes until I tell you to. Okay, so fight the ordinary temptation to scan around the slide. Keep your eyes dead center in the middle of the Union Jack until I say so. So that is, look right here, try not to move. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, let a little bit of time elapse. Again, uh, kind of go into a zen-like state or a, a, a take control over your bodily processes and uh, don't allow your eyes to drift all over the place. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're thinking. This takes place at a fairly low level of the neural system. You can daydream, <laughs> fantasize all you want as long as you don't move your eyeballs. And when I, I'm going to count down to five and when I say go, what I want you to do is move your eyes over to the uh, there's a black dot on the other side of the screen. Five, four, three, two, one. Look over here. <laughs> you should work to see a nice new jack uh, in the right, right colors. But this is, this is the kind of thing that you see in uh, cereal boxes and Cracker Jack prizes and intros like textbooks for decades. But here's a much better one. This one again. Uh, he, by the way, perception psychologists often have tournaments to come up with the most 
dazzling, amazing, gobsmacking illusions that they can. This gets kind of boring after a couple of decades. Um, the annual conference of vision researchers has a prize for the best new illusion. And I think the following one may have won one year. Spots, the color after image is no longer uh, properly aligned with the contours of the object. So again, we'll do it one more time. Black and white. <laughs> All of that. I know those colors are triumphant. Okay. Now, um, so I've given you an example of a temperature after effect. I've given you an example of a color after effect. Now it turns out that the brain processes motion also with opponent process circuitry, and moreover, the. Uh, Habituation applies, and here's the way it works. If you're, actually, maybe I'll show it to you and then I'll explain it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. One more for color after effects. Look at the spot, the cross, I mean. Now, uh, do you see a, if you keep your eyes fixated at the cross, do you see a bright green spot spinning around and around? That bright green spot does not exist. It simply is the absence of purpleness moving around the circle, as you can confirm if you move your eyes away from the plus. Uh, but that, is, again, is another... Uh, okay, now stare at the spiral, please. Right here, try not to move your eyes at all. I'm going to bring the lights back for a second. Okay, so I'm... Uh, we used to have a, a, a cheesy science fiction tele, a television program here. It's, it's called The Twilight Zone. I don't know if it was ever syndicated in the UK, but it always began with a uh, spiral like that. So stare, stare, stare. Don't move your eyes uh, away. Just look right, sorry, right here in the center. Okay, stare, stare, stare. Okay, now I'm going to count down. And uh, I, what I simply want you to do after I finish counting down is just look back at me. Uh, in fact, just look. Uh, when I say go, just look at my nose. Okay? Okay, so 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now look at me. This is the, uh, the great exploding head illusion. <laughs> Uh, yeah. 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 Um, you don't need, don't need fancy technology to experience this illusion in everyday life. I actually uh, encountered it by accident once when I was mountain biking uh, in California. And uh, as I was going along a trail, I suddenly reached the edge of a cliff and looked at the uh, uh, cliff on the other side of the ravine. And it seemed to be moving backward. Backward, backward. And I was just staring at it, trying to figure out what was going on. I thought, am I having an LSD flashback from the 60s? And then I realized I, I never took LSD in the 60s, so it couldn't be that. Then I realized that it hit me. It is a motion after effect. That I had spent about half an hour moving forward through dense uh, forest with the leaves moving outward, outward, outward uh, as uh, the mountain bike was uh, progressing. Then, when I got to a neutral, non-moving stimulus, the cliff on the other side of the canyon, uh, it looked like, basically, it was visually contracting, which is the opposite of the expansion from looking at the leaves. Contraction equals motion in depth, and so it looked like it was perpetually receding, but at the same time, not going anywhere. Uh, an even earlier version of this was called the waterfall illusion, coming from the fact that if you stare at a waterfall <laughs> for a period of time, then you look over at the rocks beside the waterfall, it look like they're drifting upward. They will be doing something that you might think is logically impossible, namely moving without changing position. Now that is impossible physically, but it is certainly possible psychologically. The explanation is the same as it is for temperature and for color. Namely, imagine that you have motion detectors that are wired into a, an opponent process circuit. So you've got a Let's restrict ourselves to one output cell. It's got a bunch of motion detectors uh, for inward motion, motion in toward the fovea that excite it. 
It's got a bunch of motion detectors for motion outward from the fovea, inhibiting it. If you have repeated stimulation of in, 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 the inward motion detectors are habituated, the outward motion detectors are fresh and ready to go. You then have a neutral stimulus, say my face, equal amounts of inward and outward motion objectively, anyway, my face isn't doing anything, but because your inward motion detectors are habituated, your outward motion detectors are normal, uh, the balance will be toward the outward motion detectors and you see the great exploding head illusion. Now that was not the miracle, though, that I had in mind. Hmm. Here comes the miracle. I clipped this out of a reputable publication in the United States called Weekly World News and it is self-explanatory. I want you to look at, at this image for one minute and a miracle will happen. I will count off a minute. Okay, look right in the center of the image. And again, I will count down. And when I say uh, go, uh, I want you to look at the white square just as the Weekly World News headline uh, instructs you to do. Okay, we'll wait, we'll give it the full. Miracles don't happen instantaneously, so you will have to wait for the minute to be up. Again, the better you prevent your eyes from drifting, uh, the, the better the uh, miracle will be. Uh, by the way, it is impossible to fixate your eyes uh, perfectly still, and there is a good reason for that, which you can probably deduce based on everything that I've said so far. Namely, if you could ever prevent your eyes from moving, the world would disappear, uh, for all of the reasons that I have just uh, <laughs> explained. Namely, every part of your visual field would habituate. Uh, the fact that your eyes are constantly jittering, they are darting over the visual field, there's even a little bit of uh, vibration, a little uh, jitter in your eye, that prevents any, uh, except in extraordinary circumstances, like some of the illusions that I've shown you, uh, that will mean that habituation doesn't actually happen, the world does not go away. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> That's my job. So, promised a miracle. It says, says so right here. I have heard, by the way, that the internet has put the weekly world news out of business, which I consider a great tragedy because many of my best slides, my lectures, come from headlines from the weekly world news. So, just to uh, sum up some key points, uh, I tried to explain to you how. A phenomenon called neural firing works as the transmission of ions through channels across a neural membrane then propagated across the length of an axon. How synaptic transmission works, a, a change from a fundamentally electrical kind of transmission to a chemical diffusion process. Feature detectors, how uh, simple patterns in the world cause neurons to uh, fire representing them. Difference between local and distributed representations, the grandmother cells versus the patterns. Computation in neural networks, how wiring neurons together can compute simple logical functions like and, or, and not. And then properties of real neural networks that uh, can explain large psychological effects, effects in your actual conscious experience. Uh, lateral inhibition, opponent process circuitry and habituation being three features of neural wiring and function which give rise to uh, the phenomena of simultaneous contrast, uh, after effects, uh, and um, uh, mock bands and other forms of uh, contour enhancement. Thanks very much.